So we're on and we're on. Okay, <clears throat> we're live. So uh, welcome everyone and um, welcome uh, to all of those who uh, have registered for this event. And a special thanks in, uh, to our panellists uh, for this after the fire and, and in fact uh, before the fire and during the battle. And he was in a panic about how much to he stop by and wanted me to come and make the judgment with him. Anyway, I flew out, he met me at the plane the next morning and he wanted me to go and look at the burnt ground, see the situation. And I said, no, this is a management situation. I need to see your planning. You know how to plan. So let's go and look at what you've done. And of course, he hadn't done anything and he didn't want me to look at the planning because there was none. He wanted me to see the grass and the cattle and the situation. And I, I pointed out there was no point in me seeing more burnt grass. I'd seen millions of acres of it in my life. No point in me looking at 5,000 head of cattle. I've looked at cattle all my life. And there was no way I could see six months of time in my mind, 40,000 acres and 5,000 head of cattle. No human can do that. And I said, we have to look at your planning. Uh, he was adamant that we look at the animals and the grace first. So I said, well, stop wasting your money and my time. You carry on on your own. I'll get in the plane and go. At that point, he backed down and we went to the house, which I wanted to do to look at the planning. As I said, it wasn't there, so we had to do it. I pulled out the uh, grazing chart, uh, the aid memoir, and got him to start doing it. He kept saying, there's no point. And I said, just follow what it tells you to do. It's a military procedure. It's very rigid, the planning procedure, but it'll produce the best possible plan. And I did gave no advice, just disciplined him to do the planning that he knew how to do, and he kept fighting it. But as the plan began to develop on the chart, as it does, he began to relax. At the end of it, we'd got it all planned out, uh, being pessimistic, allowing for a month later in growth of uh, grass coming on, allowing for later periods with uh, water coming into dams, allowing for some to dry off earlier. In other words, really planning pessimistically. At the end of the whole planning, I said, now, are there any areas you're worried about? There were a couple, so we could work out how many animal days per acre would be taken out of those paddocks when the cattle came into them. And uh, we could sample those on the ground with actual square yards or square meters of ground. And to cut a long story short, he had to do no destocking at all. He pulled through without. Now, had we not done that hour, hour and a half of planning, uh, it would have cost him, I don't know, fifty, hundred thousand uh, dollars $100,000. It would have cost him. But just doing that hour and a half of planning in which I gave no advice at all, the planning process just brought the knowledge out of his head onto paper, and I cannot do more than tell that sort of story to urge people to do it. There, there's, we've never had anything that beats this process in giving us peace of mind in droughts, fires, anything like that. So that would be my, my first point to make. And then the, the other two are essentially uh, long term. Uh, if we're going to face the fact that global desertification, Australian desertification, U.S. desertification is getting steadily worse and worse. Uh, we're going to get more and more aridity, more and more droughts and floods, more and more fires. We know we're now getting mega fires. Now, when you look at, at that, um, long term, we need to start reversing that. And there is only one way to do that, and that is to reverse desertification. I mean, I think that's just common sense 101. And if we're going to reverse desertification, it simply cannot be done without livestock uh, properly managed. And properly managed does not mean mob grazing or rotational grazing or any of these fads that are coming on. It literally means holistic plan grazing or better, something better as we develop it. And we know that that reverses desertification 
does it consistently. We've never had it not do so. And so we need to start getting people doing that so that we can steadily improve the productivity of the land, the stability of the land, and just producing the, uh, improving the productivity alone improves the financial position so that you can fight fires if you have them uh, better. So, so that's a, the, the second point that we need to get people to understand um, is uh, trying to alleviate the position for the long term. And then when it comes to the mega fires, I, I looked at an excellent um, uh, program on it on uh, video, a film program documentary, and it was interesting throughout that documentary on the mega fires, uh, mostly in Australia and the United States, the, no mention was made of any way of combating mega fires except using fire. Now, uh, you know, really this is because we've got academic advisors who are highly theoretical advising people producing such documentaries, etc. Um, and what they do not realize is they believe that we've got thousands of alternatives and different things you can do. Well, we haven't if you break it down to tools. Humans are a tool-using animal. We cannot even drink water unless we use a, a tap, a pipe, some technology. If you're not going to use technology, you'd have to go to the nearest river and drink with your hands and your mouth. So we can't even drink water without the tool of technology. Now we've got thousands of tools under that heading from chemicals to machinery, uh, to computers, to the stuff we're using right now to talk across the world, but it's the tool of technology. There's nothing in the tool of technology that can prevent mega fires getting worse. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist. You just need to have simple common sense to understand that that's a biological problem that cannot be solved with technology, no matter what you do, no matter how imaginative the technology of the future. Now, what other tools do we have? We have fire. And for 99% of human existence, we only had two tools, technology and fire. And now you can understand why in that documentary advised by, I'm sure a lot of experts, they recommended fire because they know full well there's no technological solution, but equally there's no solution using fire. It was fire that caused such a fire-dependent vegetation in California and Australia, if Tim Flannery is right, and I believe Tim Flannery is right in what he wrote uh, about that. So if we look beyond technology and fire, what other tools do humans have? The list is painfully short. The only other thing we can do is to rest the environment. And if we rest the environment in the highly inflammable areas that the megafires are occurring in, we get more oxidation and arid inflammable material building up. So we, we increase the danger of megafires. Now, what other tools do humans have? And I'm afraid that the toolbox is almost empty now. The only other tool we have is to use plants or insects and small animals, etc., with technology. In other words, to use technology to plant grass, plant trees, etc., or use technology to use bacteria to make cheese and wine, this sort of thing. So at that point, we've come to the end of the tools in the human toolbox. No other tool has even been dreamt of, thought of, or produced in over 10,000 years until we came along with holistic management and suggested there was a desperate need to add another tool, which is the physical impact and the grazing impact of large herbivores. Any animal that eats grass, vegetation, etc., and has a moist gut, be it a kangaroo, an elephant, a donkey, a cow, a sheep, or a goat. Use those as a tool to help us solve the biological problem. So really, now we're talking about holistic management at a policy level, so that the government of Australia or America or anywhere else can begin to devise policies that reverse desertification, 
and begin to combat the mega fires. But as long as we rely on present reductionist management, reductionist development of policies, we have no hope for the simple reason that there is no tool in the toolbox that can do the job. So I think that's enough uh, said by me, and let's let the discussion just go. Hear what others have to say. Beautiful, Alan, and um, thank you. And I'll certainly come back to you on a number of points, and I'm sure others will. And um, particularly when it comes to, uh, from my perspective, getting yours on policymakers and how we how we start to work with those folks. Yeah. Um, I'll switch over to uh, Art Ludwig, if I can. Um, Art, I'll just un unmute you. I think that's how I do it there. There we go. Unmute. There we go. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you fine, mate. So Great. welcome, Art. Um, thank thank you, you for making your time available today as well. And you're, you're in the thick of it there in California and up in the hills there, which are pretty... Yeah, you probably get ants in your pants at times of the year, I'm sure. So welcome. So, yeah. What, yeah, what so your... we, have a, we have a very different situation here where we've got an environment where there's, there's not a lot of grazing going on um, at all. Um, there's the, we're, we're in Southern California for people who don't know in Santa Barbara and uh, used to live on San Marcos Pass. I'm now in downtown San, Santa Barbara. Um, and a lot of my um, opinions on this sort of formed in this crucible of this specific place where our neighborhood um, is on San Marcos Pass. Uh, it's a community of about 100 people uh, surrounded by national forest. It's a, I believe it's, I've heard it's the second most uh, intense wildfires uh, of any place in the world after Australia. And uh, there's only one way in and out of this community, and it goes straight uphill into the um, sundowner winds. <laughs> There's a bunch of um, sources of ignition up there. So uh, my concern is, you know, what if what if we can't get out of there? Um, and um, I think, you know, the for most people in California, um, wildfires kind of boil down to an architectural issue. There's, you know, the the environment is fire adapted the plants are fire adapted they like fire they need fire to grow um and um there's very little loss of life um typically even you know with the thomas fire the biggest one in history of the recorded history of the state um there was very little loss of life relative to the scale of the event i think there was one firefighter and one person fleeing who wrecked their car um so mostly it's loss of property and um we've kind of painted ourselves into this corner where over decades of aggressive fire suppression where we put out every fire that we can put out that's been the philosophy um, the fuel just keeps relentlessly burn, building up, and then it all goes off when we can't put it out. Um, the fire severity index, if I've got my numbers right, it, uh, anything over 167 on this scale, which takes into account all the different wind and humidity and temperature and everything, is considered extre uh, severe or extreme. And the day that the Thomas fire started, it was at 270, which is the highest value ever recorded. And, um, you know, once this decades old fuel starts going under conditions like that, pretty much the only way for it to go out really is for the wind to stop and the weather to, to shift. And um, that didn't happen for this fire. It was the longest contiguous duration of red flag fire conditions on record. Um, I believe it went for 12 days when I heard perhaps longer um, without stopping. Um, and, uh, you know, here we talk about restoring something like the, the native management regime where um, almost every environment in the state was burned on a regular basis and the fuel did not accumulate um, to uh, any great degree. I've heard anecdotally that in Mexico, there's no more um, loss of uh, property 
or acreage burned than in California um, with essentially zero fire suppression just because it burns so much <laughs> more frequently. So, um, you know, we've created this situation where the more we put fires out, the more extreme the events are when all the fuel goes off. And yet we can't get from where we are now to a situation where there's more frequent, less intense fires because we've got a trillion dollars worth of property um, that's made out of a mixture of kindling and toxic waste, uh, which is what we make houses out of these days, that spread all through um, the wildland urban interface. And then we learned in, in uh, the Santa Rosa and also the Thomas fire that, that the, uh, the extreme fire um, danger zone extends right down into the urban grids. Um, so all of these things together have kind of led me towards an architectural focus to solve this problem um, or to address this, uh, to manage this situation, um, specifically making houses that, that can't burn um, or that, that are much more fire resistant. And um, as I was going through this whole pro uh, thought process, there's also uh, fraternizing with a bunch of natural builders who like to make things out of earth, um, which is an inherently extremely fire resistant material. It's um, uh, entirely non-flammable, also non-toxic, non-off-gassing. It absorbs quite a bit of uh, heat and um, it's, uh, it has the same thermal mass. Earth has the same thermal mass as concrete, roughly adobe, um, but half the thermal conductivity. So it, it also insulates. Um, that being said, pretty much every natural building that I'd seen um, failed on the details. So there would be nakedly exposed wooden rafter tails. Um, should probably a good point to mention the threat from within. Uh, quite a few of them sport a, a patently unsafe uh, wood stove installation. <laughs> so <laughs> that's something not to lose sight of. Um, and, um, you know, single pane glass, wooden windows, all these things. So we embarked on a 15 year, $150,000 odyssey to remake our um, our wooden cabin, uh, you know, essentially rebuild it before it burned rather than rebuild it after it burned. And um, we gradually armored the thing with um, natural building. I have some photos here, um, mainly of the details. Now, let's see, how can I so share? Just give me two shakes there, Art, and what I'll do is I'll just uh, get you, I'll just. Just bear with me. I'll just make you the presenter. So I have two screens open. Is that going to confound yep. things? I have to, uh, uh, oh, we'll, 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 we'll find we'll find that out, uh, <laughs> and then we'll be. So you, you can track my images from there. I don't know. We'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you should have got a message saying that you're the host. Or offering okay, you that you, position. So you see, I'm going to share position. my screen. Let's see. Yep. yep okay. So, oh boy, I have a lot of different options. Just here. go to the first one. one. Yeah. Okay. We'll go with that. Yeah. All right. And let's okay. see. My little monitor. Oh, no. It's showing my. Uh, just, just grab your face thing. Go to minimize that. So you've got those four options in the top left hand corner of that uh, Zoom box. Or well, you can just drag it over into one spot. I am not seeing what you're, what are you seeing? What I'm seeing is uh, there's a little, I can see your whole screen. There's a whole lot of photos and there's a zoom box. Oh, actually, no, that's me. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You're all good. I can see your whole screen. So you've got a whole okay, range so of Okay, so I'll excuse like my a, video, but I'll just trust that you guys are seeing these photos. Um, yep. So these are not in any particular order. But I'll just go through them. Um, one of the big things that we are uh, looking at is um, when you go away and leave windows open to ventilate the house, that created a major vulnerability. Um, so we mostly um, 
ventilate with these turbine ventilators. Can you see my mouse at all? Yep, yep, we can, yep. Okay. So uh, this, this shot here, you see the turbine ventilator, uh, light colored metal, it's reflective. You can see also the um, solar tube skylight. It has a Pyrex bowl as the top of it. So it's got an oven resistant um, glass top. Inside the turbine ventilator, you can see these metal blast gates up in the top. Uh, here you see it in closed position. Here it is open. Here it is looking up inside of the thing so that it's all um, non-flammable. Um, the door, doors were an interesting issue. Um, you know, windows, we've gone to uh, dual tempered glass windows built directly into the earthen wall. In our climate, at least, the hygroscopic effect of the clay sucks the moisture out from between the panes, so you don't need to buy expensive sealed units. You can just dumpster dive tempered glass, which they throw away in vast quantities because they can't recut it. Just set it in the wall how you like, put the two pieces there, and let the clay suck the moisture out from between them. Um, and then we also did fire shutters. Um, but the door kind of confounded me. I, I got a reliable account from Australia of someone whose thousand dollar metal fire door um, heated up so much before they got into their fire bunker that it distorted and wouldn't shut. Um, that was kind of terrifying. Also, of course, it transmits a bunch of heat. So I was looking at my fancy fire door here, which you can see with the little um, Mayan symbol on the front and then realized that I could use it as the framework to cover it with earth. So we have what may be the world's only two Adobe doors um, for my workshop and office respectively. You can see it there getting plastered. Um, other little details on the door to keep ashes from going through, uh, or embers, I'm sorry, from blasting under the door and getting inside. Embers are the main thing that um, catch things on fire. You can see here where the wood frame around this um, uh, stained glass window in the stucco wall we covered with earth. Um, clay paint, just an eighth inch layer over wood, enhances fire resistance quite a bit. Uh, here you can see our other adobe door. I think it's it for this photo collection. Um, and then what's mainly interesting me these days is the possibility of um, putting all of these elements together in new construction. So I'm, I'm currently trying to talk Santa Barbara into permitting this plan for making a little village of um, adobe safety cottages, um, which have entirely non-flammable construction. So there's it with our previous house, the old wooden cabin is still inside the uh, earthen fire resistant envelope. Um, so if you leave a window open, that thing can catch on fire. Uh, in contrast, this is entirely made of, of earthen walls. <clears throat> There's some steel mesh reinforcement in there. The floors are earth supported by old um, steel drill stem. Um, the railings are metal, uh, roof is ferro cement, um, so really nothing to, uh, to catch fire. Um, and throughout this odyssey, I, uh, oh, I see if I could share this video with you here. Um, I've learned to not trust the, whoops, that was a different thing. I don't want that one. Um, rating, fire ratings. Neonto Evans came to my house and at that point we'd done the walls but not the roof. And he said, well, it's your roof that's gonna burn your, you know, this is lovely, but it's your roof that's gonna burn your house down. And well, what are you talking about? This is class A rated stuff. And it's tar, Art. <laughs> say, well, you know, they must have, uh, um, you know, some kind of fire retardant in it or something. So well, let's let's try it. So we snipped off a little piece, and of course it uh, is kind of hard to start like a tire, but then it burns like napalm. 
and I did this test here um, to see how it went. So we've got a cedar sh shingle on one side and then um, a class A asphalt uh, shingle on the other. And of course, they, there's a just vast area of roof that's covered with this stuff. And I feel like it's a real betrayal on the part of the building code system um, that these certifications are kind of rigged to allow this stuff. So what they do is they put a um, burning brand on this thing and it's supposed to take 10 minutes, you know, go 10 minutes without catching. What they don't tell you is at minute 12, the thing um, just really catches. So there it supports flame as long as you've got the torch on it. Then it goes out by itself. Then before long, it's not only burning, but it's dripping this, this flaming napalm stuff. Uh, so you definitely want to get this, this kind of thing off of your roof. Anyway, that's my pitch, um, my bit. Look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks so much. Uh, that's um, that's great. I remember years ago when we were looking. I can't remember who it was, but uh, they suggested the vegetation doing something similar. You know, sit around a campfire or during the winter, a good time. Uh, get different leaves. Um, and throw them on to check to do the same with vegetation. But I think it's uh, that's great what you've done there to really uh, clearly illustrate what goes on and uh, heaven help you if you had that happen to your house. So thank you so much because uh, that's a lot of... And um, all right, so we're going to shift over to Brittany now and give her... So what I'm going to just bear, bear, with me, bear with me while I get the organization of that all sorted now Brittany, did you have any slides at all that you were going to show or you i think you did say you you did yes i do have some visuals uh, and i'll give you the cue when i'm ready for it okay so no worries cool. right, well, i'll just i'll just shift you over to being so hang on i'm just gonna oh claim host that's what i've got to do Sorry about that. Now, just while I've got that lull, um, while I'm claiming back my host from, from Art, which I've now got, thank you. Um, if you just, I didn't introduce this earlier, but uh, if you have questions, just either use the Q&A panel or the chat panel, and we'll get through these presentations and discussions over the first hour. And then um, in the second hour, we'll open up the chat. So, so Park, if you've got questions, by all means, get them off your chest there and put them on the Q&A or chat and we'll park them and then we'll kick on with them a bit later on. So thank you. All right, so go for it. Brittany, are you ready to have your host key over so I can, it's all pretty smooth for you? Yeah, that sounds great. Sweet, all right, no worries, make host. Go awesome. For it. Well, welcome. All right, thank you. thank you so much. Hello everybody from around the world. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be sitting on this fantastic uh, panel with a lot of wonderful gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to do my best to hold it down as a young buck lady here in Southern California. Um, Art, we are practically neighbors. I'm here in Los Angeles. I really appreciated uh, your presentation of how infrastructure uh, is a part of a solution. I really do appreciate it. I hope to meet you soon. Um, <laughs> I wanted to add on to that when we're designing infrastructure for, for you know, future prevention of catastrophe of our infrastructure, I think that it's important to think how we can design to integrate livestock into, uh, into our communities. And that would include uh, access of trailers. How do we think about fencing, all of these things? Um, my specialization has been in urban grazing uh, for fire hazard prevention and vegetation management. So. Um, I love to talk to urban planners and architects to remember that we are going to need access to get uh, hundreds 
uh, if not thousands of livestock on the urban periphery and in urban areas. So keep that in mind in your designing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. So I'm going to share my screen and flip over to uh, my presentation. And let's see. All right. Art, uh, just while I've got you, um, it seems that Art's screen is still sharing, so that's what we all see. So you might have to do something there. It's a bit weird that that happened. It should have just uh, clicked off. Uh, so just should, have you shared your screen, Brittany? There I am. I should be. I see select window. There we go. That looks oh, we perfect. Go. All right. Great. The world all is right. I'm, all of these algorithms gonna... are working. <laughs> all right. I think everyone does. You, does everyone see my title screen? Yep. All good. Okay. Great. Thank so you. I'm going to share a little bit about you no know, sweat. I'm going to share a little bit about what we're calling prescribed herbivory here in California um, for vegetation management using managed grazing. Uh, for fire hazard prevention and, and now in light of all of the catastrophic um, on historical record, the greatest fires that we have known in California, um, how we can uh, use management for post-fire um, treatments. So my name is Brittany Cole Bush. Uh, I am from, born and raised in California and I've been working in the space of land and livestock and uh, representing a next generation of, of grazers. Um, I'm from California in the Western states of the United States, and there are lots of efforts uh, in using managed grazing as a tool for vegetation treatment as an ecosystem service. So we are actually getting uh, paid to manage our livestock on uh, urban, urban spaces, uh, peri-urban spaces, suburban spaces, very much so unlike your traditional land lease. So we're kind of flipping the script, getting paid to graze based on using an ecological approach, a holistic approach and managing vegetation, um, uh, using livestock and grazing and animal impact as a tool. Um, here is a little bit of California. If y'all don't, aren't familiar with its lovely shape, we call it its own country in the United States often because of how different it is from other states. Um, I wanted to just show the breadth of, uh, how, uh, let's see if we can get there. I'm gonna see if I can show you how tremendous the fires have been um, this, uh, this past year. And I'm gonna see if I can go to page. There we go. All right, um, just so you can see you know, what we've been dealing with in 2017. In December, these were, let's see if I could back that up. December fires, on uh, November fires, October fires, September. And you can see, you know, our state has been burning and it will continue to do so as long as we are not managing it. That's so the call is now. Do. Sorry, Brittany, um, that, that's, yeah. I don't think that that flipped over to the other, well, it didn't. We've still oh. got the, the original screen. So you might just oh, have I'm to click I'm sorry to that. about so that. That's okay. Just slip over to your Google. All right. Let's see if I can do that. And can you see my Google now? No. All right. I will uh, make sure y'all get a link to see how insane yeah, this is because okay. it's definitely worth it's definitely worth uh, seeing what California has um, been enduring and of course that's this is the case all over the world uh, in these brittle environments and as long as we don't have resiliency resiliency in our ecologies we're going to continue to feel the effects of all of these uh, increased natural disasters around the world. Uh, due to what we know is climate change and the science revolved around climate change. Here's a couple photos of what um, aftermath of what we've just been experiencing in both Northern California and Southern California. Um, that lower right 
image was seen on the five north um, in Los Angeles. You can only imagine what kind of site that was in one of the um, most highly dense um, populated areas in the United States. Um, this was only about 15 miles uh, above um, my family's home. So you can imagine when it's close to home, you feel, you feel the heat, so to speak. And so my, my work and the work of our community in land and livestock and managed grazing, holistic management, um, it's, it's, you know, the call is now. Um, but I'm very excited to say that there is an increasingly growing movement uh, and interest by both public and we're starting to peak the ears of public agencies after we've spent uh, upwards of $200 billion in California um, with the catastrophic fires this year. Um, so managed grazing is a solution and alternative to chemical and mechanical treatment. Um, it's effective when, when, it, when it is the correct uh, tool. It can create new jobs it can increase the resiliency of our ecologies and it can prevent wildfire and it can manage lands after wildfire. So I'm gonna show you a couple uh, examples of what is going on in California. These are, this is a photograph uh, above um, the uh, San Francisco Bay, East Bay area. Uh, this was about 400 uh, sheep and goats, uh, hair sheep and Spanish boar goats. Um, California is not the only spot that's using uh, managed grazing. We have uh, Seattle, uh, the Amazon headquarters is using grazing. Um, we have, we have ha things happening. Continue. So the first outfit that I worked with um, working when I was uh, working with Star Creek Land Stewards, a uh, contract grazing outfit um, in California, we worked with the East Bay Regional Parks District, the largest urban park in the United States that have been employing contract grazing um, with, uh, to treat um, several hundreds of acres every year. They uh, have 65 parks and spanning several counties of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, you can see this is the area that East Bay Regional Parks District lives, uh, highly populated, very, very densely populate, populated areas. In the late uh, 1980s, there were severe fires that really kicked off the East Bay Regional Parks District to see that they have to manage these lands that, that they, uh, that they uh, have jurisdiction over in, in its stewardship. And so they moved to goat grazing as a tool. Uh, I just wanted to point out during these catastrophic fires in 2017, none of the East Bay Regional Parks District's areas where grazing uh, has been used as a tool um, um, were affected by fire. So I would love to uh, have a map to show where the fires were versus uh, where grazing has been. Uh, used both in contract grazing and also just your your uh, livestock um, production and and where grazing is. I want to see you know where the land bases are um, that were impacted versus where grazing as a tool has been employed. And East Bay Regional Parks District is a is a a leader at, in a public agency um, using contract grazing for fire hazard prevention. And I applaud their efforts and the growing efforts around the Bay Area. For folks who are decision makers choosing to allocate uh, monies towards this work, uh, East Bay Regional Park Districts, you know, you could see how extensive it is. And um, there are, I think, uh, close upwards of 500 acres that are being treated uh, with uh, two contract grazing outfits, both using thousands of animals uh, over a span of four months in the driest, most brittle um, times of year. Star Creek Land Stewards is the fantastic grazing outfit I had a chance to work with, and they are growing and going strong. Um, the big thing now is more animals. We need more animals to do this work. Here's a few examples of, of the, how close we are to the uh, suburban areas and that infrastructure uh, using about 400 animals um, 
tightly, densely um, managed in electric fences, we can treat uh, up to two acres a day. This is much faster than folks with weed whippers on the side of the hill. Uh, livestock can go to areas that are unsafe uh, uh, for machinery. Um, there's noise pollution that you have with uh, uh, mechanical treatment. And also, you know, an incredible alternative to chem chemical uh, treatments um, that can uh, affect our, our, our very, very uh, important watersheds. So, and, and the public wants alternatives. And these little guys, uh, actually, they're big guys. They, they, they're healthy animals, um, do a fantastic job. Here's a before and after photo. And this work can be done really quickly. So you could see how effective it is because of um, how fast those animals can do their job. Uh, we do our best to manage the animals. So we do leave ground cover, but we really do want to impact that vegetation. High density, um, low duration, high impact. That's the goal. Here's a good example of a fuel break about, uh, I don't know how many feet that is away, but up on the top of the hill are um, very high value homes uh, that, that is in an East Bay Regional Park. Uh, again, that's about 400 animals taking a siesta. You have sheep and goats. We use both sheep and goats because sheep are grazers and goats are browsers. And so together they're able to hit both the shrubbery, the more, uh, the more tough things, and then you have the, the, the sheep that um, prefer uh, grazing grass. Here's an example of a very steep incline and one acre paddock for one day. These guys do a great job. Uh, this is our buddy's chaos sheep outfit uh, in the uh, North Bay of San Francisco, Sonoma County, Napa County, uh, Lake County they treat. Um, they graze in vineyards uh, managing sheep and this was one of their fire hazard reduction jobs. Um, it impacted it, hit it pretty heavily, uh, but depending on the time of the year, you can get some really great regrowth and we're trying to support uh, resiliency in what grows back. Um, Darren, feel free to give me a time check because I want to support um, the fact that we got more, more folks. Um, let's see here. This is uh, an image of <laughs> sheep and goats um, on the Berkeley Marina in the background. Uh, you could start to see some of San Francisco, which is pretty exciting to see. Um, how close those animals are to some of the densely populated areas. Um, here's a before and after. Here's a couple before and afters. This is the infrastructure in that type, tight suburban area. Um, Star Creek Land Stewards is known <coughs> to safely move uh, hundreds of animals <laughs> through uh, traffic. Uh, this is an on-ramp on in uh, Oakland area in the Bay Area of San Francisco. Um, folks are in this area are starting to get used to uh, what it means to have goats coming in and off the freeway. <laughs> and a little bit of an example of modern day uh, urban grazing. <laughs> And uh, here you have the East, um, here in East Bay Regional or East Bay. Um, this was a Caltrans. So the California Transportation Department is employing these goats to graze around uh, infrastructure. This is the Caldecott Tunnel um, from Oakland. Um, something really exciting is that this, not, this is not just happening in the Western states of the United States. Uh, contract grazing is also being employed uh, by Efecto Manada, I just had the chance to go down to Santiago, Chile, where um, the founder um, and director Isidora Molina is using sheep and burrow to now pilot project grazing, uh, grazing projects along the urban periphery of Santiago in uh, the metropolitan park there, the fourth largest urban park in the world. Of course, it's a new project. There's a long way to go, but it is absolutely inspiring to see this work proliferate and being managed by a young woman, um, my, my counterpart in South America, I like to call her. Burrow and sheep.
is what she's using. There's Isi, uh, this was only right before the new year. Here's her burrow uh, following a, an electric fence line. And this is her moving the burrow out. What better way than public roads with uh, cyclists and pedestrians? So uh, what do we need to do <coughs> to proliferate this type of management? Well, we need new skilled grazers. We need a new generation of grazers um, to be able to perform this work. And also we need to help uh, educate and train those who, who are livestock producers on how to um, get into this work as ecosystem service. Um, public awareness, public needs to know. We need government support and we need collaboration on several tiers. So with that, uh, I'm going to, oopsies. I'm just gonna show you a little bit of animal impact. I'm, I'm sure Alan, you would appreciate this, uh, this, I, uh, this is a swarm right here. That's what I think. And then you have the hair sheep following the goats. <laughs> um, I'm, one of my biggest efforts right now in, in my work and my passion is helping to come up with ways to educate a new generation of skilled grazers um, in collaboration with Fibershed, a wonderful nonprofit in the Bay Area. We're working to uh, do a needs assessment on how we might be able to start a uh, grazing school of the West to help train new skilled grazers for fire hazard prevention and other ecosystem services. If you'd like to learn more, uh, pastoralismprevailing.com, you can find the information, uh, a report that I um, created in a presentation about what I learned from the shepherding schools in Europe uh, in an investigation last year and um, as well as surveys of those who are interested and industry stakeholders. So thank you for, I whipped through this and uh, I'm, I'm available should you have any further um, questions or interests and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Darren. I don't know where, oh, there he is. Okay, you're on mute, D. There you are. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm good now. So thank you so much for that. And I, a good segue over to uh, David Holmgren, um, his, uh, his darling, who I don't know if she was hovering and uh, has long experience with the use of goats and um, around their beautiful property in Hepburn in Victoria. So welcome, David. And um, thank you so much, Brittany, for your efforts there. And uh, it's, it's brilliant work, but I'm sure we'll come back to that. Thank you again. So, David, I'm just going to... Well, you don't have any uh, presentation, I think you no, said, so. No. Uh, yeah, it's uh, great to hear the three presentations and uh, it's been difficult for me to decide what should be my focus in this area because I am interested and to some extent involved across the range from uh, the larger um, land management issues right down to the the details of uh, architectural design. And as you said, in a small way, we've been uh, using goats to graze the public land around our uh, two hectare property on the edge of Hepburn Springs, in which I assessed when we came here in the mid eighties was the most fire prone town I'd seen in Victoria which is of course the most fire prone region in the world. That being said, our town hasn't had a, a bushfire sweep through it since 1906. And a lot of that is of course luck. Uh, in the time since the Second World War, it's also because we've had some of the most effective volunteer firefighting services possibly in the world. Uh, but it's also been the decline of uh, the small, if you like, peasant um, uh, landholding and grazing management where everyone had a house cow that grazed on the public land and people used the forest, thinned out uh, our very fire prone eucalypt forests and were actively managing the land. Now, I wouldn't say that that management was necessarily the best in recovering the land from the massive impacts of the, the gold era in this region, 
in the 19th century when all of the landscape was completely denuded of forest and even uh, of soil, as you know very well, uh, Darren. But that ad hoc management of the land, uh, of public land, of the common effectively, did uh, contribute to keeping the fire at bay. And it's an example of how in many places around the affluent world, uh, including obviously California, this decline in land management of traditional land management is one of the major factors that's led to this expansion of fire. And as Art said, the more effective suppression of fire um, has been a major contributing factor um, as well, especially in our uh, shrubland and forest systems uh, like he was uh, speaking about. So those factors are combining with um, climate impacts with drying climates as you move into uh, in Mediterranean climates to lower rainfall, you still have vegetation systems that are created, capable of generating uh, substantial biomass. And until the, the vegetation systems readjust through uh, chaotic fire to a, a more desiccated landscape, the fire intensities can increase. I think the, the wild card in, in relation to climate change is the increase in extreme weather events because fire really, uh, the large scale fires are a product of extreme weather, particularly wind as uh, was uh, mentioned by Art. Uh, so of course it's the, also the hardest factor to predict in weather forecasting is wind speed and direction. And that makes it very difficult to manage very large scale fires. Um, as uh, Alan pointed out, there are physical uh, physics limits to the capacity of any technology to control and suppress fire. In Australia, generally, the figure used for the upper limit of any control of fire is about 10,000 kilowatts per meter of fire front, which is a sort of an unimaginable um, release of energy in a, a crown fire, but also is possible in large, very large grass stands. There's been estimates that some fires in Australia, forest fires are releasing over 40,000 kilowatts per meter of fire front. Now, as well as those fires being uncontrollable and uh, essentially need to wait till the, the weather changes, the dynamics across regions uh, where there is very large scale fires and new fires breaking out, multiple fires, the top down centralized management system not only comes under enormous stress and fire managers are faced with managing something that they will probably only do once in their professional lifetime, uh, you actually get the inevitability of structural breakdown in that management. And this is actually similar to the breakdown that occurs in all sorts of systems, that the most elaborate top structure fails first, and then you get down to the core of the uh, start of the system is the last element left functioning. Like to give a social analysis, some analyses of, of extreme famine in East Africa have showed you get social breakdown and then the mother-child relationship is the last social function left as you get this extreme catastrophic breakdown in social function. So in bushfires, um, and to an extent in other natural disasters, the reliance on professional firefighting services and ignoring the need for resilient and self-reliance at the household, uh, at the individual, the household 
and the community level is a setup for larger scale disasters. And this is particularly so in the long affluent countries and places exemplified by Australia and California, where people are disconnected from nature and natural forces, often high levels of obesity, aging populations, multiple um, aspects of disconnection from reality, we can say. And what we've done is try and compensate for that for with greater and greater professional services. Uh, and there is no substitute for that self-reliance. So the way that self-reliance works, obviously in a rural community, there is a degree of responsibility for managing rural property. But at this um, urban interface where the uh, fires have become so significant uh, in their potential impacts, uh, we often have people who don't have that awareness and certainly don't have a fire plan. And I think going back to what Alan was saying, planning in the broadest sense is essential in dealing with fire and that that needs to be by the household that everyone who is in an area which is at risk of fire must have a household fire plan. And the difficulty with these plans is that there's a bifurcation in the planning process about essentially staying and defending or leaving early. And this was the phrase coined by Australian um, uh, bushfire educator and communicator, Joan Webster, back in 1964, to encapsulate the evidence from the science of large scale bushfires and people's responses to it. And the, the natural response is to flee a fire late in the piece. And we know that's the major cause of deaths and that in bad bushfire days in Australia, what constitutes a rational approach to leave early is on an extreme bushfire day, it's early on that day to leave or the night before, not when fires are actually happening. Now, the difficulty with this is that the interruption to everyday life is extreme. <laughs> and it's a reality that we're actually going to have to face that either one has to redesign life around these events and accept this process and or there needs to be the recognition that it's possible to stay and defend most reasonable buildings. So the science of how, bush, how houses burn in bushfires was started in Australia following the 1944 Beaumaris fire on the fringes of Melbourne and we've since had study after study that has provided enough database of how buildings burn. And although there's some, uh, for an Australian, some eye-popping things about Californian house construction, like the uh, tar tiles that uh, uh, demonstrated, um, I think that the important thing that came out of the CSR research is that the presence of an able-bodied person is between two and four times more significant in determining whether a house burns than any design factor or feature. Now, of course, we don't have thousands of houses in bushfire-prone areas that have been designed to the highest standards of uh, uh, bushfire resistant design. But we do have examples uh, from 1983 and uh, 2009 where houses that were designed specifically um, as bushfire resistant houses burnt down in the absence of anyone being there. My early learnings on this were really uh, in the house uh, where Bill Mollison and I developed the permaculture concept 
a very poor house in terms of bushfire resistant design. And it's the house he saved from the great 1967 fires with a mop and a bucket. Uh, he saved another four houses uh, in that area while another 12 burnt down. And all of that occurred after the fire front had passed. The great body of evidence shows that houses burned down from ember entry, and the biggest of that is entry into the roof space, and that it is actually quite difficult to design houses to not have ember entry. Uh, so as well as all of the aspects of bushfire resistant design, the recognition that it is certainly possible to survive in a, a fire in a, a reasonably constructed house. And I'm not necessarily talking about their, the best design house. We certainly do live in a, a house which is designed as bushfire uh, resistant. Um, it is Adobe, but I don't place an enormous expectation that this house could survive very severe fires with no one here. So that factor also feeds into a recognition that when we leave a property, often the authorities will not allow us back in for a long period of time. If they do have control of the situation, uh, 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 an authority paternalism takes over where they control everything and people are excluded from getting back to their properties that may involve livestock, it may have involve all sorts of things that are happening. So people need to understand if they have a leave that they will sit somewhere passive in a fire recovery center, watching the television screens, giving the same messages over and over again with their plastic care package uh, from the welfare authorities. And for some of us, that sort of reality is uh, perhaps worse than dying in a bushfire. <laughs> uh, so the choice of self-reliance and being in a community and actively defending is a real and practical one even if uh, that involves facing these extraordinary psychological challenges. So I think the main message that really came through from the uh, Flywire House design project that we did back after the 83 fires was that bushfire resilient design, both in, a, in terms of a house but also the water systems, the vegetation systems around a house and the land management are all part of a, a psychological confidence building that depends on an active fire plan and the ability of people to stay and defend. So uh, in a way, all of those processes we're going through are giving us the confidence to stay and defend, but it's actually our, ourselves being there that is the uh, active um, agent. The other aspect that I would like to mention is that if we believe society is on a trajectory to greater technology, greater communication systems, greater economic power, there's at least a case can be said that more resources thrown into centralised management and evacuating people and attempting to manage from the top down may be possible. <laughs> Climate change doesn't make that sort of uh, a very likely prospect. But if we are heading into a future where the capacity of authorities due to budgetary constraints, due to economic contraction, due to complex technology and communication systems failure might be increasing. And we're more like in a situation in 
undeveloped countries, then that means relying on those central systems is, is, is very dangerous. And the rebuilding of household and community self-reliance is actually essential in any case. So for example, the idea of being able to evacuate relies on this just-in-time guaranteed supply of fuel and vehicles that all work in all conditions and roads that are in perfect condition and maintained open. That's an unrealistic expectation. So that aspect of rebuilding that capacity to uh, stay and actively defend, or if not actively defend, what Joan Webster calls shelter safely, uh, is something that I think Australia has been at the forefront of in the same way that we can learn a lot from what's happening with managed urban fringe grazing, which we've been uh, great advocates of, but barely exists in Australia and it's at a micro development scale and we can learn a lot from what's happening in California in that regard. I think some of the lineage of uh, household uh, planning and this approach of policy of recognition that you can't actually manage and control large fire events totally from the, the top is something that um, perhaps we've been a little bit further down that track in Australia. We've still got an enormous amount of problem in terms of community education and an appalling lack of awareness, but it's, I believe, a better situation than exists uh, in, in California. Uh, I think on the larger scale, uh, in adding to what Alan and Brittany have indicated in terms of this, the great tool of grazing in managing land, uh, I would also like to at least flag the development of rehydrated landscapes along watercourses and a shift away from fire prone vegetation. Uh, because that's been one of my passions as well in the Hepburn Regional Park below us, this development of deciduous vegetation, uh, rainforest analogous vegetation, and the slowing and spreading of water to rehydrate the landscape along watercourses is a perfect complement in a Mediterranean landscape to uh, grazing of the drier, hill slopes and um, uh, open woodlands for which there's no way to develop a, a sort of a permanently moist fire retardant vegetation in the Mediterranean climate. But along our corridors, along stream courses, we can develop tree uh, closed canopy forest systems where there is high levels of organic matter breakdown to humus and uh, the, the eco structures through trees, especially like willows and others that spread and slow water and create permanently hydrated landscapes, even if there's no uh, flowing water. And of course, that's a very long-term um, landscape redevelopment but I think it is an important one, especially in the urban fringe areas, because those areas are the same areas where we have enhanced stormwater runoff. So we effectively have larger flows of water going down these corridors, often in destructive flows. And though those flows can build these corridors of fire retardant um, vegetation. Of course, that has a whole lot of other ecosystem service functions associated with it. Uh, and we've been trying to do that on our public land and that flies in the face of some of the mainstream land management that tends to try and 
reimpose a fire ecology along these landscapes uh, by poisoning corridors of naturalizing willow and other deciduous trees and replacing them with eucalypts, <laughs> which of course Californians would understand it doesn't really make uh, a lot of uh, sense. Uh, but similarly in California, the chaparral and other fire prone um, vegetations are, are not uh, pragmatic, ecologically functional landscapes to have along corridors, stream courses, especially close to urban areas. And there are many, many other species of, uh, of trees, especially oaks and um, a lot of other trees that are, uh, if not fire retardant, um, uh, 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 much burn with much less intensity and that assist in the, de uh, the decomposition. So the last thing I would mention in relation to that is the speculative possibility that in our some larger fire prone forests, as well as all the management that's possible from thinning forest and where appropriate grazing, finding the microbial cultures in our existing forests that are already the most effective microorganisms at breaking down litter within our existing climates is I think an area of research that has great potential. So we can spread these cultures and assist in uh, accelerating decomposition which there's still a huge blind spot about fuel reduction because in Australia and in California, fuel reduction is synonymous with the next word burning, but you can reduce fuel by accelerated decomposition. And of course in the grassland systems, that's what the um, uh, well-managed uh, grazing is, is doing. It's accelerating that decomposition. I think I'll leave it, David. I'll, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to check in if I can because uh, we've we we started five five minutes late, so we're we've got to get some questions for the next hour, which we've eaten quite a lot into. So sorry to cut you that. I don't have a, a clock running there and couldn't see. No, that's all right. <laughs> and I'm sure uh, all of us on this panel, uh, myself included, uh, have no problem whatsoever um, in using up the time that we have. So um, yeah. and a little bit. So thanks, mate. Um, enormous insights, as they have been from all of you. And um, and I did link um, when we started the uh, program uh, or announced this program. I linked a few of the pieces that you mentioned. Uh, Joan Webster's great work. Um, yeah, I think there's the essential bushfire tips and the essential bushfire handbook, and then your own um, the. the uh, the uh, Flywire House, uh, which is a really great piece. And uh, I'd add to that, I know um, up at the King Lake fires in 2009, I think what that was, um, I went to, I actually stayed at a property when we went, to, we did an after the fire event there with uh, the film actress, Daryl Hanna, um, as part of that recovery time. And um, we stayed at a farm there that uh, was owned by a, a Buddhist lady and it was probably the worst um, house design for bushfire. Um, it was elevated, had a had uh, it basically it's it, the it, the roof was mulched by eucalyptus litter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the house was elevated. It was it it had uh, the shit everywhere. You know the verandas were, were caked with you know fuel cans. And I mean, if you you couldn't, it was like a film set for a film for a fire disaster. And then the landscape, it was on a north-facing hill um, with, uh, with the world's tallest flowering um, species, Eucalyptus regnans, um, and all of its litter. And it was just a disaster waiting to happen. But she said that she sat in her house when the fire was on. And this was a fire that cost, I think, 220-odd lives, and a lot of which were in that region. She sat in her house when the fire was on and she prayed. And that was all that saved her. Yeah, so it was just luck. And whereas all around it was, you know, you've got trees which are nearly 100 metres in height 
which had which had burnt. It was an, a, an incredibly destructive scene. I went to another house the next day, uh, which uh, I think the uh, person was a client of yours, David. Uh, they had a um, mud brick house, very clean. Management was 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 clever. They also used holistic plan grazing, so the landscape was was managed well. And in that, I'd like to add that uh, one of the outcomes, and I think this would be interesting from you, both at you, Alan, and, uh, and Brittany, is one of the outcomes that we're seeing with holistic plan grazing is a shift back to per, some of the perennial native grasses in landscapes, which in themselves are green over summer. Um, because as we build up carbon stores in soils, well, then uh, we increase the... Uh, water effectiveness of the, uh, the or the rainfall effectiveness of those landscapes and we shift the uh, the, uh, the the land uh, the the grassland ecologies over to not only having green in the winter but also having green in the summer and that's something that that property had um, and they'd actively managed and they stayed and the fire did go through their place and yet with that um, they basically had no visible damage um, even though the fire front went through. So, you know, there's certainly examples uh, where <laughs> um, even under the, the worst scope, and that's one of the worst fires that we've had um, in, in the scheme of things, um, that, uh, that you can have just good luck um, or you can have great management. And, uh, and I think that's part of what a number of you have talked about here. So with that, I want to pass over to some of the questions that we've got. Um, and unless, uh, uh, Art, did you want to quickly say something because you've got your mic on? Or, um, Well, as long as I've got the talking stick, I just want to say I agree with everything that, um, that was said uh, by Brittany and David in particular. And, and uh, Brittany, to add to your marketing, Around here, fires start all the time from mechanical brush reduction, which I don't know if goats start fires, but it doesn't seem like they would <laughs> very often. Um, and uh, yeah, having a, a tight house definitely helps with the peace of mind thing that we were talking about, especially now that there's no break in the fire season, you know, we just basically, you know, winter solstice, we were looking at the urban grid burning up. Um, and yeah, the extreme variation in conditions make it difficult to take lessons from any particular event. Um, and then speaking to what David was talking about with the cultural piece, we definitely have a, a huge issue here, both with the nanny state, but also with the incompetent populace that that engenders like we're so deeply committed that like when you think about it you really don't want these people in charge of their own safety or anyone else's like it's it's a tricky situation and um and it, it is it's very difficult to figure out accurately what you're up against um in you know in terms of these extreme events and there is a non-zero chance of going down with the ship when the conditions are really crazy uh, and um so yeah all of those things um blend you know blend together cool well i've got a thanks thanks Art. i've got a couple of questions that have come up <clears throat> uh, one was from uh i've got one from timothy Sex hour, um, who's done some Rex work with us, a couple of them there. Um, for, this is for Alan Savory. Um, in your initial comment, you spoke, uh, Alan, about grazing as the only means to, resert, uh, to reverse desertification, which is uh, in brittle landscapes. Are you suggesting that we ought to alter the native ecology in the mountains above places like Montecito and Santa Barbara? Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that you don't know those places, but. Um, from the ancient fire prone system to a silvo pastoral system? Uh, and would, would this just be in and around human settlements as a fire buffer and re water retention zone? And I'm curious about your vision and what it might look like even in the settlement zones, as Art said, um, not so much grazing going on around there, but lots of deer, oak, bear and such, and, uh, and also mountain lion and all of that sort of thing. So. Would you like to speak to that at all, Alan? 
Uh, let's get your mute off and mute. But the, the gist I of it, you, by the way, I'm, I'm reasonably familiar with the Santa Barbara uh, yeah. because we've got family there and go and visit and, and uh, uh, they were staying with us while, and we were watching the fire anxiously with their houses threatened and everything else. So um, the when um, you look at an area like that, it, 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 desertification, which is a major part of what David was talking about, this ever more violent weather, all right, that is happening because of desertification, which is a major component of climate change, without uh, going into too much detail there. So that desertification around Santa Barbara is pretty severe. As you go south, it gets more and more severe. As you go north in California, it gets less and less because desertification is occurring only in brittle environments. And you're right getting towards the margin between brittle and non-brittle environments as you go further north in California. So if fire is to be reduced in Santa Barbara and all that country south, uh, my point is it can only be done with livestock. And that has been coming out in the talks and it makes what um, Brittany is doing so exciting and making a good start at, at developing the skills we'll need to do it. If I could, um, when you talk about the, the wildlife there, it'll be part of it. Because when you look at the desertification, Santa Barbara and South, um, San Diego, etc., cetera, I became, made myself extremely unpopular because I commented on the appalling loss of biodiversity in uh, preserves and national parks, which is occurring around the world in New Mexico, California, etc., in brittle environments. And um, so correcting that, whether you're trying to save desert tortoises or save more, uh, us from more violent weather, any of these things, at the end you come back to the management. There is only one cause of all the problems that we're discussing today. It is not due to livestock, it's not due to coal and oil, it is not due to greed or all the things we are blaming. Uh, if it was, how would we explain severe desertification and loss of biodiversity in national parks. Nobody's even explaining that. We're just ignoring the fact that it's taking place. So our problems are not being caused by livestock, coal, oil, or any of these things. They are 100% by how we manage the land, the environment, and everything else. So if we're going to um, solve these problems, we have to address the cause. That is just common sense, that if we address the symptoms, fires, severe fires, ever more violent weather, we will never solve the problem. We have to address the cause. Now, who in the world is talking about the cause? That's the problem we're facing. Almost nobody is talking about the cause. We're all talking about the symptoms and how to combat the symptoms. So when we look at the cause, which is management, what is it in management that is causing this? And it is the lack of a tool. In reductionist management, there is no tool that can help us biologically solve this. So the work that Brittany is doing and the people with her, this is vital. They're beginning to bring it into the public mind that you have to learn how to use livestock. Now, the other aspect in management, it isn't just the lack of a tool. The other aspect in management is that in management today, when we look at something like we are looking at, these severe fires in Australia, California, etc., even if we bring in the most sophisticated team of experts uh, in every field, and even if they're fully aware that there are social, environmental, economic consequences to our action, you can guarantee they will reduce that web of complexity to the problem. Ferocious fires, how do we deal with it? That is reductionist management. We must not reduce the web of complexity to the problem. What we have to do is what David was talking about in, in a way there when he was talking about, about the social aspect of this. That is vital because it is humans that are causing this 
management and getting them involved. And when he talked, and I was listening to David talking about almost redesigning life around the family and getting that social responsibility for the fire down at that level, um, he was almost talking about redesigning life, etc. That is what holistic management does because we do not reduce the complexity to the problem. We get that community, be they in Southern California, middle of California, wherever, to develop a holistic context. How do people want their lives to be? And the environment that will sustain that and not have these fierce fires, erratic weather, etc. And that is what policy and management and everything steers towards. And we have those context checks to check that any action we have to deal with a problem or a need or a desire is in that holistic context of how everybody wants their lives to be. So I, I my own view, and, I, and I, I will keep expressing this to the day I drop dead, is we need to address the cause of the problem. And we, I think we can do that because it's if we change one thing, and that's the management, the rest will begin to resolve itself because most people are good. Most people are meaning well. Most people are trying to do the best they can. We've got a tremendous lot of knowledge about the fires in Australia and California and fighting them and everything. We're not lacking knowledge. We're not lacking goodwill. It's just the management we need to change. Now, I, I think that if, if we can focus on that one thing, nobody can argue it. Who can argue that management needs to be holistic. No scientists are going to argue that. And if we folk change that one thing, the rest will begin to change. It really will. If we don't change that one thing, 50 years from now, we'll be having webinars like this discussing how we deal with fierce fires. Let's hope we, uh, we don't have to keep having those webinars. And thank you, uh, <laughs> to Ken Allen and uh, interestingly too uh, in your discussion uh, I know that uh, David is working with um, with uh, Dan Palmer who you may well have uh, corresponded with and his family to develop a holistic context and um, into what they're doing down there at their property as well so so it's a it's a it's a great meeting of all of these ways uh, uh, you're a great admirer of the permaculture concept and all that it's brought and so it's great to at least create this space for that. But, of course, you know, we don't want to keep having these conversations. I think that somewhat uh, I would expect that we probably will be because we all know the, the human animal too well. <laughs> and uh, this frog fries in the pot slowly, so um, <laughs> doesn't tend to jump out too well. Even those who've been tremendously affected by fire um, go back to the same places again. We do see that and... Uh, you know, the danger seems to have passed and off we go back to it all again. It's uh, There's a certain inevitability and I don't think we can be naive about that and I know you're not. So thank you. What's interesting though, I, I think, and I, I point this to you, Brittany, and with some of these other questions and uh, to also to you, David, and Art, is this witnessing of um, the change in floristics that occur once these management uh, changes occur. So, David, you were talking about um, the establishment of um, more uh, non-flammable species, you know, exotic, particularly in Australia, more exotic species um, in waterways, in flow lines. Um, Brittany, you would have, and Art, you probably would have, ex uh, I know, Art, you've uh, worked on that from a, from a landscape perspective. Brittany, have you seen that with... And, ha and over what period have you seen that on, on the grasslands or on the hill slopes that you've worked with um, in, in, in fluoristic changes that are, as a, are a result of uh, changes in management? <clears throat> well, we've definitely seen a vegetation population change over time. So with the East Bay Regional Parks District, uh, it's a multi-year contract and it's been about five, I don't know, with the time that I worked there five years and with five years of this type of management, you're seeing different types of vegetation. And every year is of course different when you look at succession and the variability of rainfall and whatnot. Um, 
But the stewardship department of the East Bay Regional Parks District has noted um, little, little bits of perennials starting to pop. So we like those because those are, you know, resilient and, and help us with filtration and all of the wonderful things. So I would certainly say that there, there is transition, but we're working on nature's time. Darren, in, in, in line with, oh, am, I, am I muted? I'm not hearing anything. You're good, Alan. We hear you. Uh, okay, I wasn't hearing anything. I was just going to say, following up with yours and David's point, if you want an example that took a little longer than the five years, it's been 10 or more on uh, the land in Africa that we're ha having the same problem, fierce fires, but it's, it's essentially grassland fires. But we, by reversing the desertification, all you're doing is making the rainfall more effective. That means you are hydrating the land and we have that amazing example there where we now have open water, reeds, fish, geese breeding, where we, and water lilies, where we have no knowledge of it for the past 100 years. So water is returning, uh, it just using nothing but the cattle, sheep, and goats, nothing else. Just holistic land grazing, and it's getting wetter and wetter. Darren, you're uh, muted there, Darren. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> um, yes, David, did you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose the changes we've seen in our, um, our wet sclerophyll uh, environments where we have a fire ecology, but the, the rainfall and the moisture regimes are clearly high enough to support uh, non-fire ecologies that, especially on the east coast of Australia, that in the absence of fire, bird distributed uh, species seed in under these uh, fire prone ecologies and develop a closed canopy uh, 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 fuel decomposing uh, vegetation. The trouble is there's a lot of uh, spaces that are in this middle transition where we have uh, the very large scale eucalypts still at high density and this uh, rainforest or rainforest analogous vegetation underneath and those areas still remain vulnerable to the very largest fires. So there's a, quite a long cycle in that transition to a less fire prone uh, management. And it's um, from my observations, there's needs to be often a bifurcation in the landscape uh, between the areas where it's uh, away from the stream courses, where we need to open up the forest thin out the forest to these fewer, larger trees, more of a grassy open understory, and of course the animal management systems and the places along the corridors uh, where we need the dense closed canopy uh, forest where to some extent grazing animals can end up inhibiting that transition and we've sort of managed that in a small way um, on the creeks uh, below us um, uh, uh, with animals and on a very small scale where you can protect individual trees so in our area for example we have the european hawthorn um, european and japanese plum and uh, many other species that are actually proliferating to create this closed canopy environment. Of course, when they're abundant, they all represent more fodder uh, for our grazing goats uh, and an alternative to the fire prone vegetation. But we're also finding especially that with um, 
our main uh, uh, occupying vegetation, the, the European blackberry, the canopy of the vegetation is actually fire retardant but the dry canes that build up underneath from years and years of accumulation are extremely fire prone and that grazing goats in those landscapes and smashing down that dry cane material and recreating not necessarily shifting back to a grassland which the the goats do over time but just maintaining it as a, a blackberry ground cover is actually a fire retardant um, uh, ground cover over the summer. So what appears to be a fire prone species in one situation is actually a fire retardant with uh, specific management. Yeah, that's a really great example. And Art, would you have something to say about that with what you've seen as well in your area? And uh, I know that uh, I know that you. Um, with your work with the grey water installations would be directing a lot of this and directing uh, particular floristic communities. Yeah, I, I wanted to underline the uh, support for the holistic management idea of treating the thing in its, its totality and certainly hydrating the landscape plays a major role um, and we found that at a small, you know, we don't have huge ranches right around here so much, but on a quarter acre and eighth acre can infiltrate just a staggering amount of, of rainwater. Um, you know, we're in the midst of the worst drought in California's recorded history. But last year, you know, we had, we had one day of good rain, rainfall and we were able to raise the groundwater level under our property by about three feet. And, <laughs> you know, discovered that that was enough, um, enough water close enough to the surface that we actually didn't need to irrigate our fruit trees through the, the whole dry season. Um, so, you know, having the, uh, you know, on the local uh, scale um, in the inhabited areas, if you have hydrated plants right around the structures, um, they can help a lot with uh, the fire situation. Um, I had an interesting conversation with Don Oaks, who's the uh, former fire marshal of Santa Barbara County. He came over to our house and it was just really fascinating to see how we converged independently from op op almost opposite directions on the same sort of solutions. And um, you know, he, he was saying that vegetation is actually an asset in fire situations in that it slows down the wind that blows the embers in um, and uh, you know hydrating that vegetation can get it more solidly in the asset uh, category and um, also I wanted to mention that you know we live right next to a very steep hillside at the edge of downtown and it's completely surrounded by a city. It's, it, uh, and when we moved in, there was goats grazing there. Um, so <laughs> that's happening here. You know, I think it could happen a lot more. Um, but, you know, the difference between having the, the same environment, um, but, you know, cleaned up a little bit of the, uh, the, the overload of dead material and uh, thickness of, of live material, that, that that can also really shift the fire ecology. Yep, you're muted. I was, uh, thanks, uh, sorry, I'll just repeat myself. <laughs> I'm uh, obviously a, a dyslexic uh, radio host is not one that you want to have normally. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say that it's really the, the, the sum of infiltration that one gets when one invites it is, is incredible. And the numbers, you know, as I say to people, once you start typing it in, the nut, you have to turn the phone sideways because the numbers, there's a lot of zeros. <laughs> And uh, it's uh, it's it's quite something, and uh, I know that you well, you know that and you exemplified that really well with that example, and the 
Um, some of the points that otherwise that are coming through, um, there's a lot of questions here. I don't even pretend that we'll get through them, but um, uh, people are um, just a quick one for Brittany. Uh, what's the ratio of sheep to goats in your gro in your grazing program? That's probably a quick one. And uh, what's the payment per head? So, um, so there's that one for you to quickly answer uh, before we get on to some of the others. That's great. I can quickly answer that. Uh, it's based on the vegetation type. It's prescriptive. Uh, we look at the vegetation type. If we have say 80% is shrub, we bring in the goats and vice versa. So it's prescriptive, you know, we'll do 60, 40, it, just depending on the vegetation type. Um, and we choose breeds of animals of sheep and goats that um, are very resilient and do well in these, um, in these uh, different types of ecosystems. In terms of payment per head, uh, we, there's two different ways we do it. We do it per head per day, and also we do it by acreage. And this is all depending on how we see the landscape, how dense is the forage, what kind of forage is it. Um, in the urban areas, um, standard rate is up to $1,000 an acre uh, with the rate of one to two acres a day. Um, in other areas, you know, of course, economy of scale, if it's 200 acres, we could drop that price. But you really have to first understand your cost to be able to then set your price per head. So um, it depends. <laughs> That's a great way to end that particular, the old it depends t-shirt. Um, <laughs> thank you. So here's another one here for us. Um, this is from Kevin Shanahan. Thank you, Kevin, uh, off Zoom. Um, in my area of South Australia, we have, we have um, a three to six month non-growing period for our pastures in the dry summer. One thing I've struggled with is how to balance the requirement to have fully recovered pastures at the beginning of the summer to eat down over the, over the non-growing period versus the risk it presents as a, as a dangerous fuel of mostly dry grasses. Do the presenters have any suggestions on how to think about this? I, I deal with this all of the time when we're doing grazing planning that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, I, I've got a bit of stick for this at our own property where we've stockpiled or on other clients' properties where we have physically stockpiled material um, and because we as holistic graziers are typically trying to have a low cost basis to our operation. And, uh, you know, you have living haystacks or standing haystacks as it were, as opposed to, the use of machinery to go and build hay and then hand it all out. So um, it is a it is a, a, a live question to have. And the way that we typically do that is by some of the solutions that people have talked about here, by creating buffers around areas, you know, managing, keep, you know, going with a land plan and a, and a landscape analysis where you're targeting those areas which are clearly going to be the, the problem. So in a lot of rural properties, it's the roadsides which are, which are the sites where um, you're very, and, and that area just inside of the fence on your perimeter, which are going to be the point source for a fire because some idiot throws a, 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 you know, throws a cigarette out the window or as they're driving by and it goes into the dry grass and see you later. Or in, in the case of people who, uh, who, are, who are performing arson, arson often happens. And unfortunately that's a really big, factor in a lot of these systems uh, or a lot of these uh, uh, fires is, is that they are often started by arsonists that they usually do them so that they're not going to be caught. So they'll do it on a, they'll do it on an edge or whatever. So, and they're the sort of landscapes that we try and have our um, clients go along and, and attack. Um, and so you might have a buffer and then you've got inside of that buffer, you've got your, you, you've got your uh, reserve of forage. I don't know if anyone else wanted to add to that, but that's how we more or less deal with it. Uh, David or or uh, Alan you might have some experience there. Um, you know, the question is really mentioning some of the complexity. You've got three to six months of dry. You don't know how long it's going to be. We're routinely dealing with seven, eight months of no rain in Africa, and you don't know how long that's going to be. You're dealing with a big area of land or like Brittany is, you're dealing with many areas of land. This is all complexity. You've then got the social aspects of this. When are people on holiday? When are they on leave? Who's managing the goats? All of this. Then you've got the economic aspects. Are people going to run their own goats? Is somebody going to do it on a contract basis? 
you know, all of these things come in. And so I get awfully worried because many people are beginning to talk about grass fed and using livestock today. And they use it talking about mob and rotational grazing. But if they listened carefully to the TED talk I gave, mob and rotational grazing are fine in non non brittle environments because they don't desertify. Those mob grazing, rotational grazing, cause the great deserts of antiquity. So when you get into desertifying environments with greater complexity and you have the complexity the questioner is asking about, no grazing system in the world can ever solve it. That is why we abandoned grazing systems uh, 50 years ago. And that's why Voisin did in Europe, where he worked out that they were losing biodiversity with rotational grazing in Europe, even though it wasn't desertifying. So that is why the planning process was developed. And if somebody can develop a simpler one, we would adopt it immediately. But the planning process for holistic plan grazing is so simple that illiterate people learn it very, very quickly. So I would just suggest to anybody who's facing this complexity, just use the process. And if you find it doesn't work, tell us where. And then it'll modify it for everyone in the world because the planning process we are using has been developed by practical farmers and ranchers around the world, and it reflects every mistake we've ever made, every problem we've ever dealt with. It changed the process until it's pretty, pretty damn foolproof. So just use yeah. it. Absolutely. I can't endorse that further. David, uh, do you have anything to add there in your experience? Um, no, I uh, leave that um, to just what's been said. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm. All right. Uh, I'm just going to be very, very selective here. This is from Connor Jones, who I know uh, is in California there. And Connor did a lot of work uh, and was one of the one of the key instigators or inspirations for this session. So I better answer better answer his question. Um, David, uh, this is for you. Short of Bill with a mop and a bucket, um, <laughs> could you speak to some of the practicalities of staying and defending a home? I had my experience with this earlier this last month in Ojai, California, just in, inland from Santa Barbara there. Um, we were successful and luck was also on our side, but any other suggestions for the future would be appreciated. Uh, yes, I, I think the um, uh, issue of household planning, uh, one of the things that we found, having had a uh, household fire plan since um, the uh, 80s when we moved into our house, uh, documented in the uh, Meliodora ebook, uh, and then since then been updated. It's our fire plan is now um, uh, a five page document and could look a little daunting. We have quite a lot more in the way of assets to protect on the property, and we now have two households. So that whole process of working out what is the response and normalising that as part of the seasonal activities, of course, doing those winter uh, and spring preparatory periods, dealing with the first hot, windy day to uh, test systems. One of the things we found is that our fire plan tended to take us up to a certain point and without there being fires in the region, uh, we never got past testing the fire plan in its greater detail. And so now what we do is we use the trigger of uh, the first, uh, what's classified here as a severe day, that I more take to be the precise um, scientific measure of a forest fire danger index over 50, um, to actually run some of the procedures that would happen if the forest fire danger index was catastrophic over 100 and or we actually had fires happening in the region. And we sort of run part of that plan. We do it and see how long it takes. And uh, it was some of those things that we did in response to the uh, Black Saturday uh, uh, fire day 
in 2009 when we had no fires in this region. But I was realising that, hey, we're in a situation where this is so extreme, we need to be acting as though there's uh, fires uh, threatening. And, of course, that exposes all sorts of things. Of, oh, didn't realise it would take that long to do that. Or what's it like to go out with your full um, gear on, appropriately clothed, um, uh, woolen clothing, um, uh, protection, and have a, a knapsack sprayer on your back um, in the preparation to put out spot fires and what's your level of fitness. Uh, because some of the situations we imagine here is that we would be very attracted to go down the public land and protect some of our valuable tree assets um, against spot fires. And then you expose yourself to personal risk by you know, potentially overreach. So there's this whole pattern of, of, of familiarisation and doing things that uh, are useful to do in other ways so that um, a lot of fire planning can end up being gung-ho, sort of very highly focused, but there's no other useful purpose other than fire in that activity. So I'd give the example of we have a, um, uh, a solar um, pump, which pumps our water to our header tank system and obviously gives us gravity feed water. But it replaced uh, a petrol pump and it's still useful to run that petrol pump um, and to need to run it occasionally for irrigation purposes um, to get extra water that the solar pump is not providing because that means we're familiar with its use. The exhaust of the pump doesn't have a wasp's nest blocking it up. And so when you need to do it uh, for a fire, it's um, ready and you're familiar with it. So this integrated systems where the vegetation around our house is all food producing fire retardant vegetation, our main motivation for managing that vegetation is its food production and the amenity that it provides. But at the same time, that is making it and maintaining it fire safe. The most dramatic example would be the grapevine trellis on the front of our house. The pruning of that for optimum management of uh, sun control and for grape production is also what keeps it as a highly safe uh, vegetation right against the house. So again, it's coming back to that holistic approach that Alan was um, um, emphasizing so strongly that both the complexity and the multiple reasons or values behind doing some action, which is a, a greater motivation rather than the single function that's just there that we just have got some giant backup system that doesn't actually do anything else because that is very difficult psychologically and economically to maintain those things. And of course, grazing is an obvious example of that is it's the, the utility, the benefits that come from grazing animals uh, that is a primary motivation and then uh, uh, um, fuel reduction is one of the uh, one of the side benefits from that. And uh, uh, so, uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, um, thanks. Um, I'm conscious of time. Uh, ordinarily, if I was at home, I wouldn't, but I've got a flight to catch, and I've got to drive six hours to get to that flight. So, uh, unfortunately, it's a it's a really long runway. This one. Um, so, uh, <laughs> otherwise, I'd love to have this all roll on. And it's clear from a lot of the questions that we're getting through here that. Uh, we could have quite a conference uh, <laughs> over quite a period to address some of these incredible issues. And you know, as Javan Banakovic has uh, 
pointed out here, um, you know, Al, he said, Alan, your point about that management must change at the level our current fire situation was born from is an important one, meeting the problem's magnitude of order with a commiserating solution at the, um, or I think that might be commensurate solution at the same order of magnitude. Um, for example, creating hydro hydrated vegetative buffers around a house doesn't address the no-burn policy that's been standard since World War II and, uh, and uh, ultimately the fuel load has, re has increased. And that's, that's, in that's from his perspective in Canada. So uh, there's a, and he's inviting a conversation around uh, what the thoughts are around it affecting change at a municipal, regional, country level approach to, uh, to improve management. And uh, we're going to be, well, I think we're, well, we're out of time to have that now. And uh, one of the things that I would encourage people with uh, the range of questions that are, which are great, you know, Hamish McCallum has talked about uh, Aboriginal management of, of landscapes, both in Australia and elsewhere, and, and, and that they did use the tool of fire there to do that. And how do we, how do we play that, that game again, which a lot of people are interested in? Um, and and a number of others. So I might just have to uh, cut in and um, and say we'll we'll give it a day. Uh, Art, did you have something that you were looking to contribute there? Yeah. Um, I was just gonna uh, underline the do fire drills practice. Um, thought everything David mentioned was was great. Learn how to handle hoses. Do practice burning. You know, burned brush. It is a sense of like, oh my God, like I can't even look at a fire 20 feet away when it's that big because of the heat. Um, collect stories. Um, <laughs> it could be potentially life-saving. Do the prolonged thoughtful observation. You'll start to see where the leaks are in your system and definitely uh, you know, plug those as you go so there's less to do when there's an actual fire coming. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'd... Uh... I'd add to that some other points. Uh, there was a question here about preventing erosion post-fire, and that was something that I think we dealt with a little bit in some of the previous news groups. But uh, I think we'll we'll jump in on that. Uh, so if I could just advise people, a lot of you who are on the Facebook page there, you're typing in and whatnot, we'll keep that Facebook page alive, and then we can have that as a space that people can if they haven't got their questions answered, get in there and then there'll be a conversation that um, ensues and uh, we'll put up a whole lot of links. So with that, uh, I'd really like to thank our presenters for today and giving up their valuable time and insight and wisdom. Um, Art Ludwig, uh, you can go to his website at Oasis Design. Um, and, uh, oh, wow, look at that. I'm, I'm very lucky. I've just got this. Lovely breakfast served, but it's also Hello, a reminder. That, it's also a reminder that I need to get on my bike. But um, you yeah, go to oasisdesign.net, uh, is it uh, Art? That's correct. Yeah, and uh, and you can yes. go there and have a look at some of Art's um, books on a whole range of integrated um, tools and technologies to not only uh, create a, a much more uh, livable uh landscape but one that's uh, very productive and inherently fire resistant so um go there for all of that i don't know if there's anybody better at that than you are art so thank you for your time and work thank over you. many many years uh to alan savory uh the savory institute uh, savory institute dot or something it's savory global uh, dot org now uh, but if you just put in savory institute you'll find him and the great team there and their global work. I don't know that anybody is uh, outside of the, you know, you look at the permaculture movement and the holistic management movement, uh, you know, two movements which are more and more are working in tandem to, which is great, to uh, develop uh, regenerative landscape outcomes uh, on a whole range of levels. So um, thank you to you, Alan, for all of your insight. Wisdom. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, to Brittany, um, Great to, to have, have you along and to, for all of your leadership in the space and uh, looking forward to a lot of the um, um, uh, more of the evidence, I suppose, and the befores and afters which, are so compel, which so compel people to act. Uh, we've got to look at all of the different triggers and uh, you're doing great work. And I'd love to see some of the uh, academics who 
take such notice of research, uh, however, uh, re uh, however reductionist, um, <laughs> have them have a look at uh, some of the work that you're doing and the outcomes that follow. And um, so thank you so much to you. And finally you, to, no worries. And thank you finally to my friend, uh, David Holmgren, who's just down the road um, uh, with his partner and love, um, Sue Dennett, um, do an amazing job down there putting out uh, um, some great publications. I can't recommend highly enough to anybody uh, having a look at uh, the Flywire House and also some other articles that David's written. I think there's a current discount on the Flywire House, house I, or last time I saw David, so uh, probably a good time to get in and buy that one, but go to holmgren.com.au. Uh, we'll put these links up on this page so that you can take a look there. So thank you, David, for your insights and work in this space and more broadly. All right. Well, now I've got to find which bus buttons to, to, to press to uh, finish all of this. So um, thank you all. And thanks to all of you who, uh, who listened in and also to those of you who's, who are still to listen in. That's one of the great things about this format. We'll be able to put it out there and generally syndicate it. The conversation is by no means over. This was always designed to be, just be very preliminary and give, give people a bit of a start. Um, but certainly, that I, as I, I'd agree with Art, you know, get, gather those stories. And these are some of those stories. Get talking. It's like succession um, uh, within your family. The, the best start, time to start talking about it is in utero. Um, so uh, the sooner you get that on, on your family's table, this whole discussion about fire and you know, be honest about where you, where you are, start being responsible to address causes, not just tap yourself in the head like Ellen did all of those years ago um, <laughs> and go for the Tylenol. Um, <laughs> go, you know, be, be honest about where you are and, uh, and, make, and make, make the best of what you've got and uh, and trying to uh, minimise any damage that may well come from the climate that you live in. So with that, thank you very much. And um, I look forward to, we'll be back to normal um, next week on the Regrarians live sessions every Wednesday at 7am Eastern Sta Australian Eastern Standard Time or Daylight Savings Time. And we'll see you then and look forward to catching up with all these fine fit people in the future. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh,